Today we're wrapping up our series called Three Little Words, and we've been looking at three things that will last forever, faith, hope, and love. Now, last week I said that hope may be the most misunderstood of the three, but in reality I believe they're, they're all misunderstood primarily because we tend to think of these three words as feelings, and what we've seen in previous weeks is that they're not about feelings, they're about action. In week one, we saw that faith isn't something you feel. Faith faith is the process of aligning your thoughts, words, and deeds with the Word of God. Last week, we saw that hope isn't a feeling you get, but it is a choice you make. The choice to be a bull among bears, to keep fighting for God's best in your life, even when you may feel like giving up. Today, as we talk about love, it shouldn't surprise you at all when I say that contrary to what you see in the movies and hear in popular music, love is not a feeling. Love is something you do. Every time I do premarital coaching with couples, I talk about love being a verb, an action, not a feeling. So today, this will be my focus to dispel the world's definition of love and clarify what love really is according to the Bible. And we'll be looking at 1 John chapter 3, which uh, was read earlier. There are four clarifications about love that I want to draw to your attention from this text. The first thing I want you to see is that love is a non-negotiable fundamental of the Christian faith. Listen to what John says. This is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. When it comes to the Christian life, I want you to know that doctrine, uh, knowledge of the uh, truth, faith, obedience, and holiness, uh, these are all necessary in living out our lives, but one level higher on the ladder of the Christian life is love. The greatest of these is love, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. This is why Paul said, If I could speak all the languages of the earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and uh, possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. That comes from 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3. Again, the greatest of these is love. Now, over the years, we've tried to make the Christian life about many different things. You know, how you dress, how how you worship, how you spend your money, how well you do the do's and don't the don'ts. These may all matter in living out the Christian life to some degree, but we must always remember that the top step of the ladder will always be love. John said, verse 11, This is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. He's saying that since day one, the heart of the Christian message, the the mark of true spirituality is love. And he emphasizes this idea again in verse 23, where he says, And this is his commandment. We must believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. This means that if you have been entertaining the idea that loving others is a secondary value, that theology or doctrine or politics or anything else is more important, then I'm hoping the truth of the Word of God will jolt us all into reality. And it'll challenge us to accept this fundamental, non-negotiable precept of the Christian life. Love matters the most. Love comes first. The greatest of these is love. This is the first clarification. Here's the second clarification about love. Love, or the lack thereof, reveals the state of your heart. John wrote, uh, verse 14, If we love our Christian brothers and sisters, it proves that we have passed from death to life. 
So he's saying that love is the evidence of God's life within you. And in the next chapter, he will say, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, 1 John 4, 7. And then listen to what he says. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love, 1 John 4, 8. God is love. If we've been born of God, we will live a life of love. For this reason, love belongs on the top level of the ladder. And then in today's text, John said something that we dare not ignore. Verse 15, anyone who hates another brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. And you know that murderers don't have eternal life within them. Now, If your view of love is that it's nothing more than a feeling and you don't have that feeling, these verses would be, well, terrifying, wouldn't they? Because they would seem to say that if you don't feel love, then you don't have God in your life. But as we'll soon see, it's not just a feeling that John is after. He's challenging us to view the idea of love as an action. And based on these verses, uh, we would be correct to assume that love is a non-negotiable fundamental of the Christian life, that its presence or its absence reflects the state of our heart. In other words, love is the proof that God lives in you. Listen to what Jesus said in John 13, 35. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Love, or the lack thereof, reveals the state of your heart. This is why love is so important. Here's the third clarification about love that I'd like to make. Love is demonstrated through sacrificial kindness. We don't have to guess about what love looks like. Uh, looks like we have a perfect image of love in the example of Jesus Christ. John says, verse 16, We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. And then he says, we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. Now, the fact is that you will probably never be called upon to literally give up your life for someone else. That's the kind of sacrifice you'll most likely never be asked to make. But I can tell you what what certainly will happen you will be called upon to give up a part of your life for someone else. You will be called upon to give up your time for someone else. You will be called upon to extend a helping hand. You will be called upon to give up your pride or to give up your right to be angry or to give up your impatience for the benefit of someone else. Those are tough sacrifices to make because if you give up your life literally for someone else, it'll make the headlines. But when you merely give up your time for someone else, hardly anyone will notice. And yet this is the kind of sacrifice that the gospel calls us to make for one another. Here's a challenge for you. Think of the people you love the most and now ask yourself, how am I demonstrating my love through sacrifice. Allow me to share a simple example from within our own church family here at Kingston West. I think most of you know, uh, at least from the Kingston West uh, crew here, uh, that Glenn is a committed Toronto Maple Leafs fan. For those in Eyebrow or other places that may be watching, Glenn is a committed uh, Toronto Maple Leafs fan. And you know, if there's a game on, you can almost be sure that Glenn is watching. However, When the Leafs are playing on Wednesday evenings, Glenn sacrifices his love of his team to instead come to the men's study. Even during the playoffs last year, he faithfully came to the study. He had the game being recorded so he could watch it later when he got home. But he demonstrated his love for the men in the study by being present. This principle lives itself out in our lives all the time. Maybe you're looking forward to a quiet day at home to just relax and do nothing, and then the phone rings, or there's a knock on the door, or your 
uh, spouse or children says, hey, can you spare some time to help me with a few things? So you get out of your chair and you go. That is sacrificial love and action. Every relationship you have that is defined by love should involve some level of sacrifice on your part. This obviously applies to your family. It also applies to your friendships and it applies to your church and it applies to all those that you profess to love. It's a question we must ask ourselves. Am I willing to sacrifice for the good of others? Am I willing to lay down a part of my life for the good of others? John goes on to say, verse 17, if someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? You don't have enough money to solve everyone's financial problems or to meet everyone's financial needs. That's not what this verse is about. But most of us do have enough to do at least something for someone in need. And love compels us to show compassion to those who are in need and to do what we can. Adrian Rogers once said, Faith that hasn't reached your wallet probably hasn't reached your heart. Love is demonstrated through generosity just as love is demonstrated through sacrifice. Most often the sacrifice we're called on to make is a sacrifice of time and or a sacrifice of money. Now your time is yours and your money is yours and you can do with them as you please. But if you're serious about living the life of love, love compels you to be willing to show sacrificial kindness to those whom God has placed in your life and even those he has placed in your path. This is the example we see in Jesus and it's the example that the Bible challenges us to imitate. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble possession of a slave, and he was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross, Philippians 2, 6-8. God's love is demonstrated through sacrifice. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners, Romans 5, 8. Though we certainly didn't deserve it, he was willing to lay down his life for you and me. And he challenges us to do the same for one another. That doesn't mean that you'll be called upon to die for others, but it does mean that you'll be called upon to live for others and to give to others. Love is demonstrated through sacrifice. A relationship that costs you nothing is a relationship that's built on convenience, not love. This brings me to the fourth character uh, clarification that I want to make about love. Really, this is what I've been saying all along. Love is an action, not an emotion. It's something you do, not something you feel. It's something you do, not something you merely say. Verse 18, dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Now, in the first message in this series, I quoted James, who said, I will show you my faith by my good deeds, James 2.18. And John is saying essentially the same thing here. He's saying that we show our love through our actions. We've been programmed the wrong way. We've developed this idea that love is a feeling and that, that may or may not lead to certain actions, but the feeling is really what it's all about. Recently, I read about a man who insisted that he loves his wife in spite of the fact that he's been unfaithful. And he loves his family in spite of the fact that he spends almost no time with them. And in fact, he doesn't even provide for them very well. Not because he's poor, but because he's selfish. And yet he insists, in my heart, I love them. Now, it doesn't take a whole lot of discernment here to figure out that that's not love. Some would challenge his claim by saying, no, you don't really feel love in your heart or you wouldn't act that way. That's taking the wrong approach, even though it's the approach we've been programmed to take. It's based on the idea that love is a feeling that leads to actions. But feelings are not the point. It doesn't matter what this man feels or doesn't feel in his heart. What matters is what he does. Love is an action, just like faith and hope are actions. 
James says, I will show you my faith by my good deeds. John says, let, let us demonstrate our love through our actions. Your feelings, no matter how noble they may be, don't benefit anyone other than you. The point of loving others is not that you get to feel all warm and fuzzy inside. The point of loving others is that you're willing to do good, even if it costs you for the benefit of others. It's easy to see how this applies to our families. Let's think about how this applies to others that we're called to love. Do we love the lost? Then we need to consider what we're doing for those who haven't yet heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do we love those who are poor, isolated, abandoned, and hopeless? Then we need to ask ourselves, what are we doing to help them restore their lives? Do we love one another? <clears throat> then we need to ask ourselves, what are we doing to demonstrate our love to one another? Do we love new people? Then we need to ask ourselves, what are we doing to make our guests feel welcome in our midst? Verse 18 Let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Love begins by asking the question, what can I do for you? Love becomes real when you follow through. We've talked for three weeks about faith, hope, and love. These are the three qualities that will last forever. They're written in eternity. And for this reason, they are the three qualities we need to aggressively pursue. Our goal is to become people grounded in faith, driven by hope, demonstrating the love of God in all that we do. Do you know what our greatest hindrance is? What keeps us from growing in faith, hope, and love? It's the idea that it's all about a feeling, that in the pit of your stomach or in the depths of your heart, you feel faith and you feel hope and you feel love. And maybe if the feeling is strong enough, something good will follow. Today I'm saying, forget about your feelings and focus instead on what you can do. Even when you don't feel faith, keep expressing your faith through faithfulness until your thoughts, words, and deeds are fully aligned with the Word of God. Even when you don't feel hope, when all hope is gone and there's nothing but despair, dare to keep fighting for God's best in your life. And even when you don't feel the kind of love you want to feel, put your feelings aside and forget about yourself and say instead to those whom God brings your way, what can I do for you? And remember, love becomes real when you follow through. Let's pray together. Gracious Father, we thank you uh, for this short study, these short three words, faith, hope, and love. And they are so key and so instrumental in our walk with you, in our journey with you. And we get bombarded from many different sides that these three words are all about feelings. And yet your word tells us these three words are directly related to action. Help us to be a people of action. Help us to uh, be a people of acting in our faith living out our faith. Help us to be a people that purposely seek hope, even in the midst of difficult times. And help us to be a people who choose to love uh, those around us and those that you bring into our path and into our life. Help us, Lord, um, as your servants, to model these words in the way that you have put them in place in the ways that you have used them in your word. Help us to be a people of action in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.